Well, let's take a look now at the papers. Uh, here with me to go through them this morning are CEO of International Marketing Partners, Alison Stewart-Allen, and also political correspondent for politics, Joe Ava Santina Evans. A very good morning to both of you. Welcome to our new set. Very nice. We're very excited about. Very nice. Thank you very much indeed. You had to say that because embarrassing in front of me otherwise. <laughs> um, let's move um, straight on to the Daily Mirror. Alison, you've picked this out, um, and it's a story that no doubt will be on the inside pages of yep. any of the papers. Yep. And this was the conf confirmation yesterday that up to 3,000 jobs were going to go at the Tata Steel Correct. plant in Port Talbot. Correct. So how is the mirror Well, this uh, basically the suggestion is that it's a, really about the speed with which these 3,000 people are going to be let go. Uh, typically, if you're going to let go that many people as a business, you have a very phased approach. It usually takes 18 months, two years. People are aware of it. You bring people with you. You offer retraining in the process so that the financial impact on these employees uh, is minimized. Uh, and it doesn't appear that that's really happened. So from Tata's perspective, they're getting this kind of coverage, uh, which uh, perhaps uh, is what they should get uh, because they really don't seem to be looking after these staff. Uh, and what about yeah. looking carefully at redundancies and trying to help people yeah. get other jobs, haven't they? They have, but uh, it's not clear from this article what that actually looks like tangibly. So if I'm an employee, I'm going to be really concerned about being laid off because if I'm in my maybe 50s, 60s, where else am I going to go? in the area as well because the, the industry is absolutely the all around absolutely and that's one of the challenges of sort of hubs manufacturing hubs uh in the uk and especially in wales is that if you have an industry that's in decline uh as the stats are suggesting in this article that you know the number of employees in the steel industry in this country is been year on year declining significantly, you're going to be pretty concerned uh, about, well, where do I go next? Do I have to move? Do I have to, you know, uproot the family and completely change my life? And I don't have the income security. Yeah, it, really tough for those workers, really mm. worrying times for them. The company itself is saying, though, we were losing a huge amount of money and the plan now is to, to focus on the, the greener option of this electric arc furnace and to let the blast furnaces go, which were also environmentally damaging. That's what they would say. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about it is that, so, I mean, if you cast your minds back to Brexit, steel was our diamond product. Steel was the product we were going to take to the world. We were going to sell it everywhere. We were going to have a free trade agreement with America so we could sell it. That steel has now been watered down, apparently, by this green pledge that the company would like to stick to. So they're going to now work with recycled steel and that's the product that they'll produce. How that will now compete with Chinese steel, I don't know because Chinese steel is not as good apparently as our diamond product but perhaps it now will be. But look, you know, I mean Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson before that, they were both very committed to keeping the steelworks open. That's why they gave them half a billion pounds. What's sad to me and worrying to me is there wasn't a phasing out plan. That's what the unions wanted, wanted, wasn't it? Absolutely. The unions wanted to see this phased out over the next few years years rather than a quick short-term fix of cutting the job straight away. Yeah, and, and we are going to be talking to someone from the unions a little bit later in the programme as well, so we'll see what they have to say about that. Um, let's move on, though, in the meantime, Ava. The front page of the Daily Telegraph, um, their headline, Channel Migrants Given Right to Work. Yes, so this is actually something that campaigners who are you know, looking after asylum seekers have been wanting for years now. They've been asking while um, asylum seekers are waiting, while they're in limbo, waiting for their claims to be processed, they want them to be able to have the right to work because otherwise they're dependent on this really nominal fee. It's around £50 a week that they're given and they have to live off of that. And then the rest of the time, they basically just sit in the hotel room waiting for their claim to be processed. Now, the Telegraph aren't particularly happy with it. They're, they've found through a Freedom of Information request that 15,000 work permits have been granted, which means that people are allowed to go and work. So they're working in the care system, also working in hospitality. But there, there's certain areas that they're allowed to work in, certain industries. So it's a short list? Or? No, it's not quite a short list. It's, it, it's sorry, without being rude, it's what the government would call low-skilled jobs, so low-skilled workers. So actually, these are the jobs that now you wouldn't be able to come over and work and you wouldn't be able to get a visa because the government have just changed the regulations on how you're allowed to get a visa here. But what's interesting is these companies are allowed to pay channel migrants 80% of the going rate. 
So there sort of seems to be a two-tier system here. If you've crossed over on the channel and you want to work in the UK in our care system, you can only be paid 80%. I mean, that's rather extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, I would argue it's quite dehumanising, actually. It's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there'll be some people who'll be saying, I'm worried about there being enough jobs for everybody. Yes. If, and then there'll be others who are saying, well, this, this makes sense because uh, people need to be humanised and have jobs, but also they're paying into the economy as well. Yes. Uh, and there are sectors like care, uh, NHS, home care, all sorts of um, caring professions uh, where there are shortages uh, of people and uh, if you have someone who has that skill and they're from another country uh, and we have a shortage here it seems sort of from a business perspective a good thing to do to to deploy that talent even if you know it's the rate the jobs are still being filled. Mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's move on to another issue that is um, on a number of the papers, and this is um, what's been described as a crisis, um, mm. the um, rise in the number of measles cases. This is the Daily Mail statement. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they uh, suggest that even though measles was declared over and wiped out by the WHO in Britain in 2016, is, it's made a comeback, uh, and an unwelcome comeback. Now, why is this? Well, it's because, increasingly, uh, parents are not vaccinating their children with the MMR jab, uh, measles, uh, mumps, rubella. And you may remember, uh, around that time, 20, maybe 2015, even earlier, uh, there was a big outcry over the safety of the MMR jab, that it potentially triggered in the autism. 90s, I think there were, there I, were questions which were debunked, weren't they? Absolutely. In fact, even we, uh, with our daughter, were debating gee, should we get her the MMR? It's supposedly we're potentially seen as not safe, uh, which was bogus. I mean, it, it was completely safe. Uh, but you have the residue of that era still with parents thinking, well, it's really, who knows, it may not be safe. You know, it's a bit like the COVID jab. A lot of people also are still fairly skeptical about whether yeah. that does the job. And I think the other thing is that, that a lot of people now don't know anyone who's had measles. I mean, I remember having a, f a friend who had measles when I was a child, but, you know, for, for, for younger generations having children now, they won't know how serious no. it can be. For no, people. and it's deadly. That's, yeah. the, that's really the point. And the reason we need parents educated, educators at schools to be urging strongly that families do this is because children potentially can die from this. And you'd hope that with the amount of publicity that this is getting and a big push um, to, to educate people that there might be a take up of, of the vaccination. Yeah, but I mean, at the moment, because of uh, vaccine scepticism, you know, that that isn't you know, necessarily on the cards. One of the big problems actually is with big tech. And there's a lot of questions that the government should be asking uh, over, you know, with Meta and with TikTok, which is, are you serving content that suggests that the, the vaccine isn't safe? Are you, uh, are you suggesting that to people who might be vulnerable? You know, people get into a space where they're just constantly reading and, you know, it, it, uh, consuming that content. And it makes them vaccine sceptic. And that's a really big question that actually the government should be exploring. OK, yes, yeah, so that's another angle I hadn't thought of. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Um, well, Ava and Alison, we're out of time this hour, but uh, you're going to come back again in the next couple of hours. So we'll see you again. But for the moment, yeah. thanks both very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. Do stay with us. We've got all the top stories coming up next.